Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Blue Bank Resort on Real Foot Lake. If you're looking for the best place on the lake for fishing, eagle watching, or enjoying some of the best catfish in the region, you'll find it at Real Foot Lake. Visit bluebankresort.com and reserve your cabin today. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum in Heritage Park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. On today's episode, Travis McLeese from the Paris Henry County Chamber of Commerce talks with Scott about how his passion for people and his community drives him to be the best advocate for his area in the world of tourism. And later, join us as we discover something new here at Discovery Park of America. Hello, hello, hello. I'm Scott Williams, and welcome to Real Foot Forward, where every week we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of West Tennessee, just like we do every single day here at our museum and heritage park in Union City. My guest today is very special because he's a brother in the tour and travel business. Welcome, Travis McLeese. Hey, how's it going? So, Travis, tell me, what is your title and where you work? So I am the executive director of the Paris Henry County Chamber of Commerce. And how often do you have to deal with uh, French like puns and people using Paris? I actually wrote down in my notes to say Bienvenue. Of course. Of course, just about every day. Um, but it's it's neat, too, when you see the folks that have no idea what they're talking about, and then you get the folks that walk in and, and you know, they're traveling because they like to visit uh, cities like Paris, and they like to, um, you know, they, they want the authentic experience. And, uh, you know, I'm born and raised in Paris, Tennessee, so I get to tell them my side of it and, and right. those types of things. So it's, it's a lot of fun. We, um, last year, we had a, a, a newscast come over a guy who was creating a, a series um, and got to take him out and let him see Paris. And of course, he wanted to capture everything that had an Eiffel Tower or any type of authentic uh, look or feel to it. Uh, so that was really cool just to see the see everything from his perspective. I was uh, learning how to translate very quickly and uh, used, <laughs> used my phone a lot to help with that. Um, so, you know, some things I've been brushing up on since then, for sure. So now for people who've never been to Paris, how far... Does Paris take the Paris connection? Not very far. Uh, we have an Eiffel Tower, which is which is really neat. And we believe it or not, we get a lot of traffic. Um, is the, is that Eiffel Tower like? Is it an exact reproduction, or mm. what? What exactly is it? So we consider it a replica, but it is not to scale or anything along those lines. Even scaled down, um, it kind of has a, it, our own. Uh, flair to it, I guess you would say. Uh, recently, uh, two years ago, we had a project where, I guess three, two or three years ago, um, where they added lights. So at, at night, the Eiffel Tower is lit. We can control those lights. They're all LED. So we can uh, turn it green for St. Patrick's Day or red for Valentine's or red, white, and blue for um, patriotic events or anything we want to do, we can, we can control those lights and have a little fun with it. So now let's back up to your childhood in Paris. Yes. Um, so you grew up there. I did. Um, what did your parents do in Paris? So, you know, I was one of those kids that had um, a very unique situation. Um, like a lot of kids, my parents were divorced and my um, I, I kind of got a little bit of everything from them, which was which is a lot of fun. My, my mom uh, is a specialist at Lowe's and she's kind of gone from department to department. So if you've been to Lowe's in Paris, you probably know my mother uh, and she sells flooring. She sells appliances. Uh, so that sales personality thing, I kind of get that from her. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my stepdad at the time was was a brick mason. So, uh, you know, he was kind of got that grit, work ethic, those types of things from him. My father's a project manager uh, for many years, worked uh, at Mohawk or now ICI. Uh, he left for a couple of years, but he's back there at ICI in Paris. Uh, so the OCD project management, got to know every detail, got to manage those projects I got from him. And then my stepmom, we joke, she's the brains of the family. Uh, she's the kind of the jack of all trades, data analyst. Um, she spent some time in the medical field. She spent some time, you know, she's got four or five different degrees and a little bit of everything. So kind of got a little bit
little bit of all of that right there in Paris, Tennessee, and that's I feel like that's what's helped shape me into the the person I am. Yeah, I mean, you're you've definitely got some strong branches and roots there yeah. in Paris. So, so the time came for you to go to school. Where'd you go to college? I went to Bethel University. So we, you know, I, I was fortunate to make the decision, had the opportunity to, you know, play football or um, loved football growing up. I was a football fan, still am, still love football. Um, but you know, after a couple of concussions and those types of things, and and you know, you just. I realized my I had a passion for the arts and and didn't see myself really playing serious college football. Um, definitely never going to make it to the pros, that kind of thing. So uh, realized I should invest in in other things and uh, love the arts. Sang in the Madrigals there in Paris, and so uh, it's our sixteen voice um, acapella group. And so anybody who sings has gone through that and um, fell in love with that. And then and then did theater. And so when I went to Bethel University, I went on a, mu- a musical theater scholarship. Oh. Uh, so got to perform there yeah. while getting a business administration degree. And that's what makes the Renaissance program at Bethel so unique is you get a performing arts scholarship doing what you love and what you have talents for, uh, but you can major in whatever you want to. So a lot like an athlete, you know, a quarterback of a football team doesn't major in football. They can major whatever he wants to. Mm-hmm. So the, the kid in the performing arts gets to do the same thing. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so that's, um, and that's what drew me to, to 15 minutes down the road and right here in, in McKenzie, Tennessee. Right, so. you didn't go far from home. Yeah. So you got to do your arts thing while you simultaneously got your degree. Yeah. When you got out, mm-hmm. was there any question as to what you wanted to do? How did you decide which path to go down? I love business. I love business. I love people. Um, and I realized that I could make an impact on people by running good business. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was able to, Bethel offered me a job while I was a student uh, doing some recruiting for the for the program, uh, as well as started doing some politics on the side, as became a, a campaign manager for our state representative, um, did some some work with him uh, for several years, and uh, just kind of getting to know the political scene and learn how legislation works and all of those types of things. Yeah, um, I love the I love the people that work for the politicians. Yeah, like you know, at any party, at any anything in D.C. or anything in the state. You know, if you find out where the actual people that work for the politicians are huddled, that's where all the good conversations are going on. It's a lot of fun. And it's and it's amazing to see there's so much passion. Those those people have the true passion oh, for it. Absolutely. And that's and I knew I knew that that wasn't the life I wanted full time. And I wasn't didn't quite have that bug. You've, you've got to have that in your DNA. Um I just I liked it enough to be a part of it, um, and I was very fortunate. Tim Morgo was our state, rep- state representative that I worked with, and you know, getting to learn from him and and just the hours he pours into every single thing he does. Um, those are some traits that I kind of was able to absorb and, and take with me throughout my career. So um, again, like you said, the behind the scenes and just getting to see how things really it's it's not the TV show you watch. It's not it's not what you think politics is. Right. But getting to go out and, you know, hang two or three hundred campaign signs uh, builds a lot of character. Yeah, do you ever watch Veep? You know, and and uh, say, oh look, that's what I used to right. do. So you know. Um so um how did you end up at some point you ended up working for Paris, Henry mm-hmm. in Paris, Henry County. How did that come about? Well, you know, I love love Paris, Henry County. I love I love my community, and um, the position became available. And so several folks um, started reaching out, and then decided it was time to to see if that was a good fit. And they hired me, um, and got to come home and be the executive director of our chamber. And, and what does an executive director of a chamber? What does that mean for people out there who don't know what a chamber of commerce executive director does? Right. So, so you know, my the best way to put it is kind of the community cheerleader. I hate using that phrase, but that's what makes the most sense. It's my job to put the right people in the room and around the table if there's a problem, uh, if there's something we need to solve, if there's something we want to be proactive about. Um, basically, all things community and economic development. Um understanding how decisions we make today may not affect us for five or 10 years, but we also be proactive and, and, and prepare for those things. And, um, you know, really just making sure that we're networking our businesses together and we're representing our community on a state level. And uh, there's just, I had no idea when I took this job, how complex it was. Mm-hmm. Um, just the amount of, um, 
relationships. It's really so relationship driven. Um, and you know, an analogy that I heard when I first started that that really helped it sink in for me is so often chamber directors get burnout. Uh, forgive me for using a football analogy, but we we try to be the the quarterback, the left tackle, the running back, the wide receiver, the safety, and the kicker all at the same time. When really the chamber director needs to be the head coach. They've got to be Bill Belichick. You got to be the best in the game so that the community can put people in those places so that we can hire the best left tackle. We can hire the best safety. We can put people in volunteer positions and hire positions. And you can take that analogy and apply it to the businesses, the businesses that apply to be a member. And they, you know, if I go in and try to help them with their marketing, I need to help them at at the 30,000 viewpoint. If I get in and, and just start clicking on their Facebook page and make it all happen and I become their left tackle, then have I really helped them? Do they really have someone to carry the ball and score the touchdown? And so, you know, you've got to kind of get up at 30,000 feet and be the best the best coach you can possibly be. Uh, and that's helped me a lot because I can see where burnout is, a, is an issue in these types of jobs because there's so much potential. You love what you're doing. You love what you do day in and day out. And there's never a day where you go, well, what do I do next? But there are also, I think, one of the challenges from looking from the outside in would be people with conflicting uh, interests who mm-hmm. both want something completely different who may both be right in their own way yeah. and having to try to, you know, get to a win-win instead of a zero-sum game, I think is probably uh, challenging for folks who are in your position. It is. And you, and that's, and that's at the end of the day, I want Paris and Henry County to win. Mm-hmm. That's, I keep that as the focus. Right. Um, now, sometimes I struggle with, is it my job to judge a win for Paris and Henry County. And that's, that's where, what, that's what you know, you, you've got to, I've got to lean on other communities, yeah. other, other relationships and other networking things that I've done to say, okay, you know, here's where I think this decision may lead us before this happens. What are your thoughts? Right. Um, and so getting that feedback and, and um, you know, you just, you've just got to do your homework. And was well, a person who loves, you know, development and loves growth and loves seeing progression. I'm also a person who loves history and loves, yeah. you know, I still won't shop at a CVS because they tore a church I liked down one time. Wow. So, you know, it's, it's, it, those things conflict sometimes. Right. And so how do you get to the right, to the quote unquote right, you know, answer? Sometimes it's a challenge. Um, so obviously there's a lot of attributes when you're doing what you what you need for a city in order to be successful a huge body of water Always um, helps. Is, is at the top <laughs> of the list you know tennessee strives to be the lar- the most successful tourist state not in an ocean you know yes. not an ocean state so we have no no oceans anywhere Correct. near us here right. in tennessee um but you guys have a huge lake so what does that mean to the to the city well, you know, we're the the recent tourism numbers came out, and we're ranked thirtieth uh, out of the out of the ninety five counties, and um, you know, fifty eight plus million dollars, and that's uh, so much of that's driven by our lake economy, fishing, hunting, uh, boating, recreation, boating, and and just so many versions of boating. Now we've got so many different water sport activities, and you know the canoes and versions of canoes and ki- it's just it's it's amazing to see people we've got a kayak fishing tournament that sometimes has two or three hundred boats in it wow um the people that come into town for that so um you know it's it is a it is the lifeline of our economy when it when it comes to the tourism industry and and as part of being on the lake you have catfish in the water of course and so catfish is also mm-hmm. whereas we have uh you know soybeans here in Obion mm-hmm. County and there's um strawberries in Humboldt and mm-hmm. you know on and on and on and on you guys have catfish we do are you the only one is are you the only catfish festival or is there there are, are there, others? there are multiple catfish festivals but, but the you're important <laughs> the important thing is we're the world's biggest fish fry. There you that's, go. That's that's what matters. Um, you know, last year uh, we sold right at twelve thousand plates Goodness. of fish. Right at right at eleven thousand pounds. That's a lot of fish. Man. Um, and it's a it's an endeavor, and that's over a four or five day period. Um, so that's you know we they kick off on Wednesday night. Uh, so they run Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So in four days they're they're putting out eleven thousand pounds of fish. Um, and what's neat about that 
is its volunteers. Yeah. Um, and so that connects to, you know, Tennessee being, you know, the volunteer state. Uh, we take a lot of pride in Henry County being the volunteer county of the volunteer state. Um, and it's events like that that are completely manned by volunteers. And does that, does that come under your purview? It does not. Okay. Um, it's, that's the, that's, yeah, that's tell me about it. It's, <laughs> I tell you, I gained, again, growing up in Paris and Henry County, you always experience fish fry. You get to go to the parade, the carnivals, the rodeos, the catfish races, all of these fun things, but you get to enjoy it. Now getting to see the hundreds of hours that these folks put in. They take vacation time. Yeah. These guys are taking vacation to go work a 60, 70 hour a week and and do everything it takes to make that event happen. Wow. And it's just it's 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 emotional. I mean from from a Henry County in, in my position, yeah. it's an emotional thing to see these people that are so passionate um, that they'll that they'll invest that and they'll invest their time and energy and uh, it just makes for a cool you know the the commission I were talking about you know rural tourism and what makes it so special that's what makes it special it's the people it's the people that put those types of events on that's what draws fifty to seventy five thousand people to Paris and Henry County for a parade right. on a Friday morning yeah. um, you know we've got ten thousand people in our in the city of Paris and we'll have fifty to seventy five thousand there for a parade. Uh, and it's because it's unique. It's different. It's, it's yeah. those types of things. Well, I saw I saw on the news. Um, and first of all, let me correct. I think I said it wrong. Weekly County is soybeans. O'Brien County is corn. So You're correct. A corn festival. There you go. We need to have like a like a little game where you list all the counties and then <laughs> draw the line to the thing they have the festival of. Um, so um, the thing I saw on the news was you had the catfish racing contest. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's, you gotta be the only people who are doing something like that. We think so. Um, we're, we, you know, we, of course, we're always trying to watch and see what everybody else is doing and make, and, you know, cause of the things that you want to say were the, were the catfish races and they, they get in a trough that's, that's probably a 15 foot trough. Um, we have five, Trolls at a time racing, and then we have different heats and different. I mean, it's a it's a full blown experience. And, and then we'll the have, winning catfish does it like get it's saved? the grand champion? Does it get rescued and thrown back into the lake? Well, you know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but th- thankfully none of the fish are. Well, you know, they they take good care of the fish. Of course, and none of them are harmed. And no fish are injured in the catfish this process. Racing. Correct. Um, of course not. Um, so, um, what what does the future hold? for Paris and Henry County. Anything coming up that we need to look forward to or that I need to put on my calendar? Well, you know, that's the it, Paris and Henry County is always changing. It's always evolving. We're, you know, this time of year, we're getting ready for Christmas. Christmas is something mm. special in Paris, Tennessee. Um, we have a Santa on the square um, from Thanksgiving to the week before Christmas, every weekend on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, so kids can come for free and sit on Santa's lap, take pictures, tell him all the great things they want for Christmas, and just really get that experience, which is a lot of fun. Um, great backdrop, great shops, great local nostalgia. It's just, it's Christmas. There's different events. It, uh, we've got a Holly Jolly Electric Christmas Parade, uh, which is uh, the second Saturday in December. It is a, uh, a lit parade. So it's every entry to that has to have Christmas lights on it. And there's the Clark Griswold Award for the parade entry that has the most the most lights and those types of things. So that's always fun. Um, then we've got the Wings of Winter Birding Festival in January. Uh, that's a, a kind of a new and unique event. That like Burning Man. Yeah, uh, you know, hey, it's it's getting ready for the third year uh, this year. Um, believe it or not, we t- uh, the Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge uh, right there in, in our area is home to basically two-thirds of the state's birding um, mm. species. And mm-hmm. so uh, we're a prime location for that, and people come from all over the country to, mm. to find birds in our area. Do you have eagles? We've got everything. Oh, I mean, wow. I, I say everything. That's not fair for me to say. Uh, everything. I'm, I'm a beginner birder, they told me. Okay. Uh, I've gone and tried to learn a little bit. Are you a bird yet? Uh, <laughs> well, no, not quite. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's we had folks that came from Utah – with a, a lifelong birding list to see a cardinal mm-hmm. because they don't have cardinals in Utah. So, or, oh. you know, just those types of things. that's so unique that people are traveling for. Um, and so this past year, uh, it rained all three days. And I'm thinking this is, you know, oh no, that's never going to happen. People are going to be upset. They found over a hundred different species of birds in the rain wow. during this event. So again, 
things that are different, that's that's our community for you. Finding unique ways to um, to utilize our assets um, and draw people to our community. And then, what's funny is is you guys have two completely different, you know, Paris and Catfish. And so when you try to think about you know marketing right. a city. You know, it is it is interesting to figure out when do you and you know the outdoors and stuff. Um, you know, it is interesting to think. You know, how do you brand? You know, things that are going on. You know, I know that uh, my wife and I were just curious, so we drove to Paris. You know, when we had recently moved here, and you know, there is a big giant, like f- like fiberglass catfish is, on yeah. a big giant sign, and so that was pretty cool. And then we just drove around because we really just wanted to see the water. So we yeah. found your big, uh, your big uh, amphitheater that yeah. you have outside on mm-hmm. the water, and I think last time we talked, you were telling me about uh, you know you had a big concert and people mm-hmm. could bring their boats out and listen to the music yeah. and you know so when we were there there wasn't it wasn't was much activity so, yeah. yeah so it wasn't that was the you know we just had our our first Tennessee River Jam so again playing on the water and and utilizing that asset um, and utilizing country music people in this area love country music so we created a three day uh, music festival uh, yeah. throughout our community and multiple concerts. We've got several venues on the water. Yeah. Um, several of our marinas have have live music venues, plus, of course, Paris Hunting State Park and um, the large amphitheater they had there. You know, we had about 8,500 people in town for that those three days, and about, um, about 5,500 of those were at the state park for the big concert there, either on land or by boat. So um, that's a big event. That's the last weekend in June, and we'll be continuing that this next year. So, yeah. again, it's, 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 we try to keep things in all seasons and keep, keep having having events and adding, you know, we've got a Paris landing sprint and Olympic triathlon because you've got a backdrop like that. People love swimming and riding bikes and, and they get to do all that in, in that, with that backdrop. And it's just, it's a gorgeous area to do it. Yeah. What, what do you know offhand, um, what percentage of people are full time living in Paris all the time and what percentage is sort of come in town for the, for the, Holiday season, the the summer season. That's a nearly impossible number to measure for us. We've tried. We're we're working on on grasping that. Um, you know, if I'm giving rough, as I call them, Travis numbers, um, I would say that probably you know during the summertime, um, you know, sixty percent of our population's visitors. Right, and then I guess um, it's, it's a large base of people that are coming in for the lake, coming in for family events and coming in to visit grandma for the week. Cause right. so you restaurants know, have to spring up and get into, mm-hmm. you know, full gear and hotels need to, you know, put on their happy face and yeah. serve the, so hospitality is really a big, a big part of that community as well. Absolutely. And hospitality training. And mm-hmm. do you, are there enough workers who work in hospitality for this region or do you think we have a need for, I think we have a need for more. Absolutely a huge need. I mean, huge need. We, we need, from the chamber perspective, we need workforce development in every aspect. Um, but one thing that we're we're focusing on and, and we've, we're, we're making some progress with is some training for uh, hospitality and food service because there's – you got to send folks to Nashville or Memphis. And so you're sending folks two hours for training. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these small businesses can't, one, they can't afford it. Two, they can't afford to have their employees away that long. Um, And then if you've got these folks that are making, you know, $12, $13 an hour, once you add their tips and all that together, it's, it's difficult for them to invest in their education and those types of things. So as a community, you're going to see us do a lot and make a commitment to provide some of that training locally uh, to them. And you're about, how long did it take you to get here today? From how far I'm about from, an hour. About from, an hour about from an hour. Discovery Park. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it would be, if anybody wanted to put together sort of a little fun weekend. Um, easy, easy trip. Including you all and going water skiing. Yeah. I haven't been on a ski boat in a long time. I need to go water skiing um, um, on the lake um, and have some French food in Paris because there is a French restaurant there. We we do have a, a French Italian bistro downtown Paris. It's called Stella Nera. See? Uh, just open just open this summer. And so you can go check that out. Um, you know, we've got several Italian places. Um uh, we've got Mustos, which I know you all are familiar with we over are. here. They, we, we we've are. we've we got a, a branch of that in Paris now. Mm-hmm. Very, very excited to have Tony and his crew over there. And then the Olive Pit has been a staple for over a decade.
Street, um, it's hard to beat a ribeye from Olive Pit. And then oh. the OP Bowtie Pasta and the the Jason Spicy and just all that. They've got so many great things. They're all mineral wells. Um, w- it's right there by the fish. So it's, got it's easy for folks to find. town square. I mean, you've got like beautiful a, the downtown. ultimate charming yeah. movie set, Andy Griffith show downtown we appreciate that we invest a lot we've you know kathy ray is our executive director of our downtown paris association which is our main street um and that group invests a lot of time energy money um our city does a great job as well our city's committed uh, both financially but from a planning perspective it's not just here's the money go do something they they're invested too and they they want to bring back ideas and make sure that um the word charm is is what we're going for. Well, this fall, my wife and I have already decided we're going to pick a weekend and we're going to find a cabin okay. on the lake there in Paris and 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 take advantage of of all the uh, cool stuff you guys have going on down there. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining me. This was really fun. I appreciate it. It's, it's always always a pleasure to be at Discovery Park. I, my kids were jealous this morning when I said I was heading this way. I've got a you know six year old, four year old, and a soon to be one year old. So we we frequent Discovery Park. That's good. You know we have new family membership. So you're it's you're great. just exactly who we're shooting for. Perfect. Well, we'll be sure to pick one of those up. Thanks a lot. And now with a little discovery for all of us is Andrew Gibson, who's sharing a bit of the behind the scenes of Discovery Park of America. Thank you, Scott. I am Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at Discovery Park of America. And today I am with David Heathcott, a docent here, who will be sharing a story that I'm sure all of you are going to find fascinating. I know I certainly did. Uh, But first, we're going to be talking about uh, an exhibit we have on display here. Uh, So, Mr. David, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, Well, uh, the topic I wanted to talk about was uh, is uh, our uh, Mark 14 torpedo that we have uh, on exhibit um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, artifacts that we have to uh, to exhibit were great successes. Uh, the 50 caliber machine gun, the Maxim machine gun, the M1 rifle, the Jeep. Uh, they were they were they were true overachievers. They 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 exceeded what was expected of them. Uh, unfortunately, the Mark 14 torpedo was was uh, did none of those things. It was uh, it was a uh, a product of the 1930s, and uh, the Navy had no money. And uh, they uh, they tried to uh, extend their technological <clears throat> technological uh, grasp a little further than they should have. And basically, what the Mark 14 torpedo is, it's a, the last steam powered torpedo that served in the United States Navy. And uh, where things uh, uh, went went amiss was uh, uh, when they tried to uh, to uh, invent a, a detonator that uh, could be. Uh, uh, influenced by the the change in the magnetic field uh, made by a steel uh, steel ship's hull, and so uh, they tried this uh, tried this uh, twice. Uh, one time it, uh, it it blew up, it blew it, it sank the the target, and the second time it just kept running out to sea. And so apparently they thought uh, uh, a fifty percent failure rate was acceptable. I guess they were a glass half full sort of people. And then they, uh, they they decided everything was uh, good to go, and they they locked locked the whole thing away to wait for war. So, with uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, now we now have have our war, and uh, uh, they're breaking these torpedoes out and these and these detonators, and uh, ordering the the United States uh, submarine force to go and and sink uh, Japanese shipping at every opportunity to, to in attempt to starve them to the uh, uh, to the point where they have to surrender. And so, uh, as we began firing these things at Japanese ships, we start uh, learning something. Uh, firstly, the, the things uh, better than half the time don't work. I think about seventy percent of the time they would fail. Uh, something would go wrong. Uh, they would either uh, they would either uh, uh, explode just a, a, a few hundred feet away from the uh, submarine, or they would go under the sub, uh, under the target and just and just be lost. Or sometimes they would even turn around and come back at the submarine that had just launched it, uh, forcing them to dive as quickly as possible and and uh, and just uh, try to make like a hole in the water and hope not to be hit. So uh, these incidents became very very common, and the reports would get back to the people that designed the torpedo, and their answer was that uh, their torpedo was perfectly fine. It was the people that was. Uh, uh, manning the uh, manning the submarines that were doing something wrong. Either they were maintaining the torpedo wrong, 
uh, or using bad tactics or a combination thereof. Uh, several submarine commanders were sacked because uh, uh, of lack of results. And in one case, a uh, an American fleet sub uh, fired 17 of these torpedoes at a at a, at a dead still target, and uh, every one of them failed to explode. So they brought the one back for examination, and it was given a clean bill of health. And the next time it went out with a submarine, it fa- it failed. And so uh, the uh, fingers, uh, the finger pointing, went back and forth, and uh, and uh, finally the, uh, the the submarine crews and the machinists at Pearl Harbor, uh, they they uh, they basically uh, disabled the the magnetic uh, exploder, and uh, they depended on the contact exploder to actually uh, detonate the uh, the uh, uh, torpedo. Uh, now things have actually gotten worse. Uh, it fails. It now fails even more often, and uh, so it had two things wrong: the magnetic exploder and the uh, the impact exploder. And so they fired uh, a few at at some cliffs off Hawaii, and then uh, bravely recovered them to see what had gone wrong. And this torpedo was so fast that it actually destroyed the the detonator before it had a chance to to uh, uh, trigger the warhead. And so uh, in in the great tra- tradition of American ingenuity, they went and they built a better detonator. And uh, it went from being a 70% of the time failure to an 80% of the time success. And they started sinking Japanese shipping left and right. And they, had, they had, by the time the atomic bombs were dropped, they had almost completely starved Japan. And But th- uh, this was thought to have added perhaps as much as a, as a year and a half to the Pacific War because these did not work. So that's a... Uh, uh, I find it ironic that that torpedo is just maybe 15 feet away from the uh, our replicas of the fat man and little boy, and I, I, you know, it's 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 a stretch, but I think it might be possible that if this torpedo had worked as it should have, we might never have had to use those two bombs. Uh, and you were going to share a little bit more personal of a story. Can you can you touch on that as well? Well, um, I was given a uh, I was given a scrapbook. And uh, by a, a, a woman that was a, uh, my mother or my wife's niece, and uh, she was uh, uh, she was leaving her home, and she wanted to go up to the attic to see if there was anything up there she needed to take. And so she went up there, and there was nothing up there except for a scrapbook. And uh, it was uh, it was in very bad shape, and the 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 book itself was was falling apart. But when she started uh, thumbing through the pages, she realized that she'd found a treasure trove of uh, of uh, World War II postcards and pictures and letters and and newspaper clippings and uh, and what they pertained to was a a young man named uh, named Hal Jake Allison and Hal Jake Allison uh, was killed at Pearl Harbor uh, aboard the USS Oklahoma, the one that that uh, capsized in the harbor and. Uh, and I have before me the le- the telegram from the Navy uh, to the family, and I'd like to read it. After exhaustive search, it has been found impossible to locate your son, Hal Jake Allison, Fireman Second Class U.S. Navy, and he has therefore been officially declared to have lost his life in the service of his country as of December 7, 1941. The department expresses to you its sincerest sympathy. Uh, signed, Rear Admiral Randall Jacobs, Chief of the Bureau of Navigation. And I, I find it noteworthy that they, they misspelled sincerest, but uh, they got 400 and some odd thousand more chances to, to get it right. Well, thank you, David, for, for coming on to the podcast and, and sharing that story and, and sharing with all of us a little more about the uh, Mark 14 torpedo we have on display here. Uh, thank you all for listening to the uh, Real Foot Forward a West Tennessee podcast, and we hope to see you here at Discovery Park of America real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.